Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to kick off the panel by acknowledging, um, first and foremost, the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, for um, his commitment to this important issue and uh, many other leaders within the Justice Department, um, including, of course, Director John Laub um, and others that um, have really taken an interest in this topic in recent years and uh, really focused on what's most important. Um, I also want to um, note that Brian Vila, who's now um, in Spokane, was originally um, the um, the person at NIJ who really pushed some of these issues about officer safety and wellness. And uh, the reason that I'm actually here because uh, the funding stream that he began uh, started the grant that I um, was able to get from NIJ with my colleagues to, to do this important work. I also want to thank Chris Rose for coordinating the panel and Chief McNeil and the work of the IACP um, because this is um, something that they've taken a very um, close interest in and um, I'm really thrilled to be um, amongst these folks. I also want to acknowledge, I think he's here, but Brett Chapman from NIJ, who was my grant monitor throughout um, the entire um, study that we conducted, um, and uh, the director of the Office of Crime Control, Winnie Reed, I think is also here. So I thank all of them uh, for this. The, the, um, the study that I'm going to talk to you about um, deals more, instead of on the personal level with officers, it deals more on the policy level. It's really focused on what are the environmental and organizational um, contexts in which officers perform their duties, and in fact, um, are these things that um, can be um, uh, really focused on in a way that um, really brings an organizational perspective in the way that things are managed because there's um, certain things that you can control as a, a police leader and other things that you, of course, can't. And so our study set, um, really sought to examine the effects of different shift practices that were in place and how those practices in agencies affect various safety, wellness, and other kinds of outcomes like performance and fatigue and, and those types of things. And um, like um, many of us, these research projects are not um, a unitary effort, of course, and I want to thank so many collaborators, uh, David Weisberg especially, who's a co-author on the works that I've done and others that I've, I've listed here, as well as the two police agencies where we conducted an experiment, um, the now retired Chief Ella Bully Cummings from Detroit, um, who has been succeeded by um, Chief Ralph Godby, who has also been committed to this issue throughout, and Chief uh, T. Bowman from Arlington, Texas, who had the foresight to really um, take this kind of issue um, under his uh, wing and really move forward with it in a research context. But moving right into this, I'd like to start out by saying that I was really interested a number of years ago in what the practices were in terms of the length of shifts that officers work. And what um, we did is sent out a survey to 300 randomly selected agencies throughout the country stratified based on size. And um, then four years later, we followed up with those same 300 agencies. And it's showing a real interesting trend. And that trend is basically that um, agencies have begun moving away, and this has probably gone back further than just the last five years, but moving away from a traditional eight-hour schedule. And this is something that always interested me because I was concerned about whether or not um, these schedules um, were problematic in some way. And it turns out that it was really because of different, um, different kinds of interests of officers and their uh, wanting to have a compressed work schedule. So what we found is that small agencies tended to favor both eight and 12 hour shifts um, and mid-sized agencies were a mix of eight, 10 and 12 hour shifts. But interestingly, um, at least as early as 2005, um, the largest agencies were um, favoring 10 hour shifts. And that was curious to me as well. And that hasn't uh, gone away. Still, the larger agencies um, have a, a greater number. There's a greater number of those agencies that use 10-hour shifts. So what I wondered was, if, if we're moving away from these different schedules, and now we're also moving to things like 9, 11, 13-hour days um, in some agencies, and this is not counting overtime and off-duty employment, um, does the length of the shift in and of itself matter? And Brian had done uh, significant work on tired cops, and of course I was really concerned about this. 
So we conducted a randomized um, experiment in which we blocked on both the site, in case there were some site um, differences, but also on the time of day, because um, people have known for a long time that working a midnight shift is a difficult uh, process. So we um, were trying to control for that factor as well. We ended up with about 223 um, officers that were measured. We measured all kinds of performance. Um, this included uh, some departmental data, like officer stops, accidents, et cetera. We also measured um, various kinds of performance and uh, reaction time in laboratory settings in both police agencies. And these measures were done through simulations. So we had shooting simulators, driving simulators, and the like, which I'll quickly walk through. Um, and then we also had self-report data, um, and much of that came from standardized instruments of things like quality of work life and stress and a number of other health indicators. So um, here's um, an officer in Detroit while we're prepping him for his session. Um, here's um, an officer that's demonstrating um, the shooting simulator that we use, which is an active shooter. In this particular case, he's just doing target shooting. Um, here's an officer preparing for a video-based series of simulations that are, or scenarios, that are part of what's called the BPAD instrument that's used for selection in some agencies. And in this, the officers responded because we wanted to test whether their interpersonal reaction uh, mattered based on how fatigued they might be or specifically how long their shifts were. We also used a, a standardized instrument that others um, on this panel have used in research that's a pupillometer that measures a number of things, including saccadic velocity, which is basically the speed at which your eye tracks light, and that's a fairly direct measure of fatigue. Um, and then we had a low fidelity simulator uh, that officers received training on and then were measured um, with a lot of different cognitive inputs going on uh, during the time, like radio traffic and instructions to the officers and whatnot. And so what, and then we finally had a reaction time measure. This is a very um, common one, the PVT, the psychomotor vigilance test, in this particular case applied on a handheld device. And what we found were that um, a couple of very interesting patterns, that the officers on the 10-hour shifts, and to me this was the most meaningful, got significantly more sleep than officers on eight-hour shifts. In fact, over a half hour per 24-hour period, which you can imagine over the course of a year is very significant and very meaningful. And I can't explain per particularly why that's the case, but what we do know is that um, we measured not only the sleep period, but any nap periods during the 24-hour period, because Brian and others have found that officers in general sleep less than the average person, and we were finding rates of 7.3 hours to 7.9 hours on average, um, which was a, a good sign uh, for many um, reasons. But that benefit of extra sleep did not extend to 12-hour shifts. And so we started to wonder if there was a curvilinear kind of relationship here that maybe it peaks out at around 10 and starts to drop off at, at 12 for various reasons. Um, and specifically, um, with regard to the economic um, and environmental concerns of agencies, officers on the 10-hour shifts worked significantly less, and I'm not talking a small amount. If you were on an eight-hour shift, you worked five times the amount of overtime hours than somebody on a 10-hour shift. That is quite meaningful and um, could possibly be explained by the fact that the, the days are limited and after a 10-hour shift, it's difficult to work more but many times it's mandated. So this was um, very interesting. This finding did also translate to the 12-hour shifts, but not to the same extent. But still, those on 12-hour shifts did get a significant benefit um, of, for the agency in terms of reduced um, overtime. And then for the 12-hour shifts, it was indeed true that maybe there is sort of a, a, a point of diminishing returns, and I can't tell you exactly when that occurs. But for those on the 12-hour shifts, um, shifts, they had a higher sleepiness index. And we measured sleepiness using a, a few different um, standardized, standardized measures, including the Epworth scale, which is a, a standard one, and some other items used by the Harvard researchers who did a, a similar type of study on officers' sleep. And, um, and so we were concerned about that. On the other hand, um, this um, problem did not, was not um, did not occur for those that were working the 10-hour shifts. So at some point um, after 10 hours and up to about 12 hours, there seems to be um, a, a sort of fatigue effect. 
However, we did measure fatigue objectively. I mentioned the, the um, reaction time measure and um, the FIT, which is a, a fatigue measure, and those objective measures did not differ across groups. But that doesn't mean that it's not concerning because uh, Mark Rose, kind of an alertness researcher out in um, California, in his past research has indicated that people tend to underestimate their level of fatigue such that um, that they um, really can't subjectively say how fatigued they actually are. And I would suspect and, and really venture to guess that officers, because of the culture, are less likely to admit that they're fatigued. So the fact that we're finding a strong effect for self-reports of fatigue is, is very um, important. And then also those on the 12-hour shifts were less alert on the job, and we measured that on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. So we didn't, however, find results on any of the performance measures. Um, we didn't find it on uh, quality of personal life. However, those on the 10-hour shifts had a better quality of work life, so happier with the job and whatnot. Um, and we didn't find any um, differences in, in departmentally measured performance or in sleep disorders, or for that matter, even in terms of the quality of sleep, just the amount of sleep, which I think is a pretty um, important thing. And so what I conclude from this is that 10-hour shifts um, really are a viable alternative, especially for larger agencies, because the officers are likely to have an improved quality of work life. It's liable to save the agency um, significant dollars in overtime, provided that they can manage those shifts appropriately and uh, maximize their resources at the periods of overlap. And then um, also the big sleep benefit, which could be a safety and um, accident um, you know, problem in the future. So the fact that officers on 10-hour shifts are getting more sleep um, while